Uh, my name is Tom. Um, like Nigel says, I'm studying at Bangor at the moment. And last year, I did a practical conservation internship at Minsmere from September 2019 to September 20, 2020. And um, it's really good. It's a cracking reserve. I'm sure lots of people know it or have been there themselves. It's in Suffolk, if people don't know. Um, throughout the talk, or well, lots of things that I've learned about Minsmere, and I'll be referencing it throughout the talk, is this book, which was written by Bert Axel, who was the warden of Minsmere, I believe, from sometime in the 50s to 70s. So he definitely had a lot more knowledge about the site than I will. And it's nice to be able to contrast my year at Minsmere and what I saw with how it was 50 odd years ago when he was there. So I will click through. So I thought I'd start a bit about the history of Minsmere. So just behind this Highland Cow's Horn in the background there, you can see some chapel ruins. And um, that chapel is actually the oldest sort of visible man-made feature you can see when you're at Minsmere. It's the old chapel from um, Layston Abbey, which has now disappeared, and it was built in 1182. So if you go back in time, sort of to medieval Suffolk or something, you could sort of think of the Suffolk coast, I like to think of it as almost like a handshake, in that you have these fingers, which are ridges of um, alluvium sort of gravels and sand. And then between each finger, you have a different wetland. And at one point, all of these gaps were estuaries sort of pushing out into the North Sea. And over time, as those alluvial fingers eroded away, the um, waves pushed up sort of shingle caps on these estuaries and flooded them into um, mirrors and reed beds and all sorts of wondrous habitats. But um, yeah, for over a thousand years now, Minsmere level, the wetland has been, had human presence on it. And the monks that would have lived at the chapel are responsible for building some of the earthworks and dikes that um, initiated the draining of Minsmere Level. So pre-World War II, Minsmere Level was very heavily utilised by humans for different things. There was decoy ponds for hunting ducks. A lot of it was drained and um, substrate was brought in from elsewhere. You can still find pits where people used to dig out what they called hogging gravel and sand to transport down onto the marsh and bring the land level above the water table to graze it and try and make a make a living but um i suppose more recently the minsmere that we know was created from actions in world war ii so although the chapel that you can see on the screen now was is over 800 years old you can just see in the background there's some newer works within the chapel and this is part of the um, works that happened in World War II. They actually converted the chapel ruins into a pillbox because they were worried about invasion coming across the North Sea and landing on the Suffolk coast. And um, alongside putting in a pillbox in the chapel and um, building some concrete tank blocks in the dunes, which both of which structures are highly appreciated by wheat ears. Um, they also flooded the entirety of Minsmere level. So at, up to that point to 1940, the land was drained. There was um, the old winding course of the Minsmere River had been cut into a canalized river. And it, it was in the state that a lot of marshland, which is still drained now in the UK, is currently in. But they blocked up the sluice and allowed it to flood, black, flood back naturally and essentially created a massive wetland which um, reed and other aquatic plants that had been existing in refugia in that wetland in the decoy ponds and the ditches then expanded out onto fields essentially every field would have become a big mere and that was really where it all took off because seven years after that um Avocet recolonized as a breeder in the UK after a hundred year absence and it did that at two sites in the UK 
one of which was Havergate Island, which is further south in Suffolk. And the other one was actually in the wetlands at Minsmere. And from that first breeding of Avocet onwards in 1947, the RSPB has had some form of wardening at the site. I think for the first couple of years after the initial breeding, there was um, a chap called Dick Wolfendale who lived in a tent on site throughout the breeding season to try and prevent um, egg theft and other <laughs> things they're really worried about back then. Um, but the more famous sort of first wardens was um, this fella called Axel. He was a bit a bit of a character. I think he started um, helping out with the wardening in 1952 and sort of became a full-time warden in 1959. So yeah, like I said, he's the guy that wrote this book. It's a great book, by the way. If everybody, anybody is interested in Minsmere or has any ties to it, you can buy that book online for a couple of pounds and it's a treasure trove of information, not just about Minsmere, but all sorts of different conservation stories and things like that. It's fantastic. Um, so wetland is probably what Minsmere is most known for. The reserve as a whole is about a thousand hectares and it's roughly 50-50 split between wetland and the dry habitats. And the wetland is split between reed bed and grazing marsh mostly. And then to a lesser extent, there's some small areas of cut fen and um, the scrape as well. So I'm just gonna talk a bit about some of the breeding birds in those habitats. One of the best known, probably the bird that Minsmere is most famous for beyond that first breeding of Avocet is the bittern. And Minsmere has, I think it's something like eight pairs, eight breeding pairs and, um, and 10 booming males of bitterns in the reed bed, which is, it's just brilliant. In a spring morning, if you walk out into the reed bed, really, really early, the sound is just incredible. I mean, they start um, booming, or trying to boom. I think they call it grunting or grunters at the end of January and early February. You can sort of feel that they're, they're warming up, warming up the vocal cords ready for the season ahead. Um, yeah, they're a fantastic bird. Lots of people come specifically to see bitterns and if you're out working or you've got the badge on you anyway, it's just constantly, oh, where can I see bitterns? Where's the best place to go? And um, even though <laughs> it's well over, probably over 20 adults in the reed bed at any one time, they are <laughs> still very hard to see. Um, I don't think there was many days when I saw more than more birds than I could count on my hand, even in a whole day watching. So yeah, they can be really hard to see, but they're fascinating birds. And this photo at the bottom is of one swimming, which I never really expected to see, but they're full of wonderful, weird behaviors. There's a video I saw recently that was taken at Minsmere of um, a bit in fishing in front of Island Mirhide, which is it's actually where the, this photo with the sunset was taken. And I think it's one of the best places to see bitterns in the UK. And in the video, the bitten lunges for a fish and catches two rudd at once. So it's caught two fish at the same time. And they're just incredible creatures. And rudd is probably their main source of food in the reed bed. In summertime, I think the water gets quite anoxic and you can see big shoals of rudd that are all about 20 centimeters or more will all come and just lays at the surface and it's amazing how much fish there are there are actually in the reed bed and um minsmere is also really important for bitterns as well because the rspv carried out a lot of research there on the habitat requirements and breeding requirements of the bitterns which they've then extrapolated out across other sites across the uk and it's allowed the species to spread as a breeder really. And they're increasing year on year. There was a Rare Breeding Birds panel publication recently about um, species that are doing well and thankfully bittern is one of them. Another one that Minsmere is famous for is the Marsh Harrier. So these were actually extinct 
un unlike the bittern. I think the bittern clinged on in the UK with just a few pairs, really, really low density. But marsh harriers had ceased to breed as a bird, and I think they must have just passed through on passage. Um, but they did recolonize the UK as a breeder in 1955, and that was at Minsmere. And that they're fascinating birds, really. They have a similar display to the famous sky dancing that hen harriers do. And if you get a really calm day in spring and you've got a clear sky and it's still and no wind, you can watch the males doing this incredible U-shaped diving high in the sky and you can actually hear them calling as well. It's, they're really, really incredible birds. I think there's roughly eight pairs breed across the wetlands at Minsmere, which is, um, it's twice as much as even Bert Axel thought could, the reed bed could su sustain. He, in this book, I think it was published in 77 or 78, he said himself that he thought that four pairs was the carrying capacity, but they quite happily double that now. And I think in part, it's probably due to the plasticity of marsh harriers in that they utilize the wetlands a lot, but they will hunt almost anywhere. I used to see them hunting out on arable fields. I would cycle to the supermarket and even sort of seven, eight miles from the closest wetland in summer, there'd be males hunting on arable fields. So that's cool. Another reed bed specialist. I think this is probably the best photo I managed to get of um, bearded tits all year, which I don't know if it's, says a lot about bearded tits or it says a lot about me as a bad photographer but yeah there's I'm, I'm not even sure how many pairs there are in the reed bed but they're just a constant presence that pinging call you hear it all the time and sort of early autumn late summer you can see the eruption flights if they've had a good breeding year you get groups of them will just circle out of the reed bed really high and head off elsewhere to breed or winter elsewhere sorry yeah, they're just stunning birds. I love the males with this coloration. The black sort of mustache <laughs> cracking birds. Um, this is another one. So we've Inzman sort of established itself as um, a great place for like those classic reed bed birds you associate with Minsmere, bittens, marsh harriers, bearded tits. But um, I suppose like everywhere else, Great white egrets now, they're just becoming so, so abundant. And um, at times there was upwards of five birds in the reed bed and they'd all circle around in the evening and um, roost in this one oak tree at the edge of the reed bed. And it, it, it looked like something out of the Amazon. And at the time I thought, oh, this is insane. Come to Suffolk and you can see so many great white egrets. But um, recently, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, I saw that group on Anglesey, or there is a group on Anglesey, five great white egrets just hanging out in a field. So yeah, they're really going strength to strength. And um, someone found a colour ringed one in Suffolk recently as well with a Lithuanian colour ring. So I think there's still a lot there to unpack. I know they've started breeding, but a lot of the population that maybe comes over from the winter, perhaps it's migratory. There's a lot we still don't know. This was another bird that I really, really enjoyed in the wetlands at Minsmere, water pipits. I had next to no experience with this species at all before my placement. And they're just so skulky, like they can hide in the reed bed and then all of a sudden when they want to show themselves, they'll come out. And um, they really enjoyed this one field we had where we grazed it quite heavily with conic ponies. So there's lots of manure and short turf and then drop the water levels and it exposes this bare mud that's just full of invertebrates and your typical wetland birds just go absolutely mad for it. Waders, water pipits. I think when I took this photo there was six, six or seven water pipits on this one field which the flash in the photo, the flash of water is about the size of the room that I'm sitting in now so that was really cool especially when they start going into that summer plumage we've got really nice sort of peachy buff breasts and the same color going through the supercilium as well 
they are cracking birds. They also really like um, these machines that cut the reed bed called, um, they're called truck saws, but they're like a giant amphibious floating digger with a submerged trimmer head. And they hire a couple of them in at Minsmere every winter to cut different areas of the reeds. And if you've got floating reed bed, they can go underneath and cut through the rhizomes. So once those have done their work, there's these cut areas where there's all the rhizomes been churned up and piled up and it creates quite a similar effect to these small flashes. And the water pivots absolutely love those as well. We had um, another site on the Suffolk coast that the same team managed, Dingle Marshes, and there was a similar number, six, seven, eight water pipettes, again, on a really tiny piece of area that had just been cut. And it was just, it was mind boggling from going to not seeing any at all before and then seeing that kind of numbers. That was really nice. Um, so yeah, the reed beds and wetlands at Minsmere aren't just good for birds. They're also probably the best place I've ever been for seeing otter in the UK mainland. Um, I think they're a fairly recent colonist. And I also think that um, otter was reintroduced at Minsmere. I'm sure I have memories of someone telling me that, that um, I think it's the Otter Trust or the Otter Sanctuary based in Norfolk were involved in releasing some into the valley. And you can see why it's perfect. I think um, all these photos are of the the same individual that I kept seeing. It's quite a skinny juvenile and it was just completely unafraid of humans. Um, the photo on the right is taken with my phone just out of the Island Mere hide. And it would quite happily sit in front of people and just <laughs> chew on fish completely unfazed. And this, this same otter spent um, probably two weeks um, on West Scrape and was just catching stickleback, tiny little stickleback, barely even an inch long in this um, aquatic plant called mare's tail. And it was, it was a delight. It, I can't tell if it just really liked the habitat or it just really, really liked detention because the hide would just be packed out with people watching this one otter. I also saw it in the sluice a few times. I don't know if you can tell in the top left photo, it's called a crab and you'd find it fishing in the sluice, catching crabs and just listen to it crunching on the crabs it was really nice so yeah that was fantastic it took me almost 20 years to see an otter on the river where i grew up so going to minsmere it almost became a daily occurrence it was incredible um yeah so this is the scrape so the scrape was created in 1962 by bert axel after the initial sort of colonization event of the Avocets in 1947. They actually didn't breed again at Minsmere for a lot while longer. And the scrape was sort of Bert Axel's vision to try and create a habitat that existed after the um, flooding for World War II. You had these sort of unvegetated mud and pools and it became really popular with bird watchers essentially because it was really good for breeding waders and passage waders and a lot of the rarities that Minsmere is known for. So yeah, in 1962, they churned up a part of the marsh with a bulldozer and started creating these islands. And now it's just, it's a cacophony. I've never been anywhere on, on the mainland as in not an island. Maybe Kemlin actually is probably the closest match that just has such a density of breeding birds. Um, just to give you an idea, I think there's almost 3,000 pairs of black-headed gull, um, 250 or 300 pairs of sandwich tern, 300 to 400 pairs of common tern, um, 50 or 60 pairs of Mediterranean gull. Um, they also had, uh, I think the breeding season previous to when I was there, uh, kitty wakes bred on the scrape on the ground which was a first so it's definitely a desirable habitat for a lot of species and little tern occasionally breeds too and i know they had success the breeding season before i was there and um 
fledged something like I can't remember, but fledged a few few little turns, and everyone was really excited. And um, this spring, it was during lockdown actually. Um, someone who'd taken their daily exercise along the dunes told us that um, there was over two hundred little turns on South Scrape on one island. So that caused a bit of a buzz. I think people were hoping that there was going to be a new sort of little turn super colony, but they did the classic little turn thing which is being indecisive and they all left within a day but yeah the scrape's a fantastic place not just for breeding birds but wintering birds and um there's five five different hides around the scrape so plenty of different angles to watch it from and you can quite feasibly spend a whole day birding just watching the scrape um to go back to bert axel's book as well it shows you how much the i I'm not really sure if it's how much the scrapes changed or how much the sort of distribution of wintering birds has changed or a bit of both. But back when the scrape was first created, they used to get a wintering flock of shorelark, 40 to 80 shorelark. And to compare that now, shorelark is a pretty rare bird in Suffolk. I think there was only two, three, sort of less than half a dozen reported. The whole winter I was there, so it's definitely changed a lot. Um, here's some other sort of scarcities you can see on the scrape. So there's a kitty wake in the top left corner. Like I said, they bred on one of the islands on the scrape, and they do breed at a lot of sites in Suffolk. Um, two of the more notable ones are just down the coast at Sizewell on the old outflow rigs of the nuclear power station. And also in um, Lowestoft on the seafront, they just breed, they breed on an old discarded pier and also just above shops on the high street. It's incredible. And um, Kessingland Ringing Group, who I did a bit of ringing with, run a colour mark scheme for them. So this bird in the top left was um, one of Kessingland Ringing Scheme's birds. And it was nice. I got to see one of my own ringing groups birds on the scrape and it was its first reciting since ringing, which was really positive. Um, some other stuff, there's some spoonbills in the bottom right corner. Spoonbills, another bird that's just going from strength to strength, like the bitterns and great white egrets. They actually successfully bred this year in, on Havergate Island as well. And um, were fairly common at Minsmere on passage. I, I think I had, a bird it was a coloring bird that um breeds at holcomb and one evening i was watching the gull roost and this spoonbill just circled out of the sky landed in the scrape on the scrape in front of me fed for five ten minutes on the scrape and then circled back up high and took off north over dunwich heath and the bird was actually back on the colony at holcomb the next morning and that was that was a fantastic feeling to just to see that and know the individual marks of that bird and then to get the the story of what it was doing so quickly that was fantastic you also get some quite weird bird bird assemblages as well one day i was watching a pair of smew copulate and a spoonbill feeding in the same scope view which is a bit weird and there's probably not many places in the uk where you can see something like that um bells. Some people love them, some people hate them. But Minsmere is definitely a fantastic place to see gulls. Um, I think here we've got a Caspian gull in each corner, an adult and a third, second, third calendar year. I'm not that good at gulls and a yellow-legged gull. Some days there's upwards of double figures of both species on the scrape, which is a real, it's really good if you're like trying to learn your gulls because Chances are, if you if there's a few hundred gulls and you look through them, you'll find one of each. And it's probably due to the fact that Suffolk has a lot of outdoor piggeries, and the the gulls will go and feed on the outdoor piggeries, and then roost on estuaries and scrapes at Minsmere. And estuaries, there's a big one further north called the Blythe Estuary in Suffolk, and a lot of gulls roost there. And they also feed on the outflow at Sizewell because of the hot water attracts lots of small fish and things like that. So there's always a lot of gulls to be seen. And 
scrape is also a great place to see little goals as well. Usually the adults would sort of just stop stop in and fly around and feed for a bit and head off. But I think one day we had 10 first winter little gulls stop off on the scrape and they're just roosting with black-headed gulls. And that was really nice to see. And you, you'd see quite a lot as well on sea watches. So, yeah. So moving away from the wet habitats, um, the dry habitats of Innsmere are probably equally as interesting. Um, it's split mostly between, the large majority is just heathland, which has a few different forms and each heathland species actually likes quite a different type of heath, but also has some smaller pockets of woodland. So um, this sort of scrubby heath here that you can see in the photo, with a bit of heather, gorse, birch, and we also had um, western gorse as well, which was supposed to be quite rare, but I don't know that much about gorse. Um, this is the sort of more preferred habitat of Dartford warbler, which is another bird that I hadn't seen before I went to Minsmere. And they're just absolutely abundant. One of the, um, there's a big book at Minsmere for bird monitoring that details all the methods for how to survey each species. And that said that in good habitats, Dartford warbler can breed at densities of one pair per hectare. And I read that and thought, that can't be true. But I did some surveys in early March and one corner on the heath, I had three different pairs of Dartford warbler within a five metre radius of myself that were just calling their heads off at each other. And they're just, they're fantastic birds. You can see them on the heath, but also um, in the dunes as well. If you're walking around the scrape, any of the gorse in the dunes, if you wait long enough, is a fantastic place to see Dartford warbler. They're definitely, um, yeah, one of the prettier, more colourful species you can see. Um, this sort of scrubby type heath as well is also home to, um, or breeding habitat for the night jars as well at Minsmere. And I think there's almost 20 chairing males across um, Minsmere Heath, Dunwich Heath, Wesselton Heath, if you combine that as sort of like a super site. And it's fantastic if you, if you can get the chance to go down there in spring and summer to listen to the night jars. You can walk through the heath at night and you can hear sort of six or seven night jars chairing it from one spot and it's just it's fabulous they'll fly right around your head and the heath also has um fireflies which i had no idea we had in the uk until i went to minsmere and no one no one even told me that oh yeah you have to go and see the fireflies they're really interesting i just went out on my bike one night to a night jar site and i was cycling home and it was like cycling down a motorway or something with cat's eyes lit up and it was all firefly larvae just glowing. So yeah, that's a fantastic experience if you ever get a chance to listen to the night jars and looking for fireflies. Um, the other sort of other side to Heathland at Minsmere is more of a sort of dry grassy heath. And it's actually the majority of the heath at Minsmere is this grassy heath. Um, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the scrub is also home to lots of other species that you don't really associate with heathland, but heathland is a perfect sort of space for this low, dense, bushy scrub to grow. And it's fantastic for other things like firecrest. Um, this photo of firecrest was actually taken out of the window of my accommodation. I had a pair that was for the whole winter that would like clockwork, fly past the window every morning and every evening, I assume to roost somewhere, but they're quite common across the heath as well. And if you go in spring, it's fantastic. There's firecrest singing just everywhere. And in the background here is a male redback shrike that turned up on quite a brambly area of the heath in spring. And they, they were a former breeder at, at Minsmere. Um, I think the last pairs bred in 1974. So they, they hung, hung on in the Brex about a decade longer, but um, they're no, no longer a breeder, but you've got a decent chance 
if you spend a year there of seeing one on passage. Definitely more common in the autumn, usually get juveniles turn up along the coast in the scrub, but this male was out on the heath, which was really, really nice to see. And this sort of scrubby habitat as well is fantastic for things like lesser white throats and garden warblers. And also the yellow hammers. Yellow hammers really, really like to breed in that sort of scrubby, gorsy heath. So this is more of the um, sort of dry grass heath I was talking about. Um, Suffolk is incredibly dry, especially these areas on the coast. When I was talking about the fingers of um, sort of ridges of sand and gravel, it's really, really free draining. And it's also some of the driest parts of the UK. So some between 50 and 60 centimetres of rain a year, not much at all. So that combined is a really hostile place for plants to grow. And you combine that with a bit of rabbit browsing pressure and you get this grassy, well, most of it's actually moss, heath that is perfect habitat for um, woodlark and stone curlew. They really, really like that short, short sward, both species. And um, you can see on this photo in front of us, this, this is actually gorse along the bottom, these sort of green humps. And it's been topiarized by the rabbits. And this habitat actually requires almost no management once you get it going because um, as soon as you've encouraged the rabbits out into it, it almost creates like a warren and it's self-sustaining and you don't really have to do any scrub removal or they, the rabbits just take care of it all. So this, this area in the background as well, you can see a few freestanding pines. This was all pine plantation um, at the turn of the millennium. And a lot of the sandy habitat in the Suffolk, Suffolk coast that would have just been vast sheep walks for hundreds of years was forested after the, after the Second World War to try and produce timber that was seen as marginal land. And then um, that had really disastrous effects for things like stone curlew and other heathland species that had started to call it home. So stone curlew up here, you can see in the top right corner, these, um, they were a breeder at Minsmere historically, and in a lot of the coastal Suffolk historically, but they actually ceased to breed in um, 1970, which was a bit of a shame. I'm not sure if anyone knows why, whether it was just things like increased cultivation or afforestation of the heaths, um, but luckily, they got a second second chance at them and they started to breed again in um, 2003. And now, or well, this this past year gone, Minsmere actually had the record for the highest number of stone curlew pairs that have ever bred on the reserve. We had 15 pairs, which is, is just fantastic. Um, and a lot of the work we did in summer, we were quite restricted because of the um, COVID-19 precautions. But stone curly were a high priority species. So we put a lot of effort into finding and fencing off the nests, um, just with a sort of small gauge electric fencing. And that has a really, really huge impact on productivity, just to reduce chances of things like badgers just chancing or foxes just chancing upon the nest and predating the eggs. Um, so yeah, the productivity, I think, for the population to be self-sustaining needs to be around 0.6 chicks fledged per year per pair. And the sort of five year running average at Minsmere is about 1.2. So it's double what it needs to be self-sustaining. And um, the birds are just going from strength to strength and they are just fantastic birds. I don't know, I'd, n I'd never seen stone curly or heard them before I went to Minsmere. And you sort of see them in your bird book and you think, oh, that looks a bit, a bit weird. Huge eye, brown. It's not that exciting, really. But the noises they make at, at night, it's like blood curdling screams. They're just, they are fantastic. And um, this bird in the top right corner actually bred just behind where I was living last year. Um, so just behind the volunteer accomodation. And that pair fl fledged a chick. Um, 
under a tree, which is not typical stone curlew habitat, with no help whatsoever, no protection from predators. Um, I even watched the fox walk past the ne nest once in broad daylight, which was sort of heart in my mouth moment. But yeah, they fledged one on their own, which was just fantastic to see. Um, I thought I'd talk about the beach because it's probably one of the most popular areas at Minsmere and it's a fantastic place for watching wildlife as well. Um, a few pairs of ring plover breed along the shingle. This is one of the pairs. I think they managed to fledge um, one chick. They definitely seem to benefit from there being less people around this year because of the um, lockdown. But I think they just suffer generally from quite low productivity in the area. Um, it's also all right for sea watching if the conditions are good. We had a spell for probably a week or two when sea watching was really good. And you could get all four skewer species. And I mean, it's not as good as a lot of places. It's not like North Yorkshire, but managed to see all four skewer species whilst I was there and a few other things. There was a, just one lone city shear water, which was really nice. And this chap, um, you can see here with the scope, Dave, he is, um, he's really, really into his sea watching and takes preference for sea watching over all other forms of birding. And if you tell, told him that you saw one city shear water, he'd be, tell you that it wasn't a very good morning. But off Suffolk, I think any shear water is a good, good sea watching day. Um, it's also great for just general trying to find passerine migrants along the dunes. So I've got um, a selection here, some nice ones in the middle. It's one of the favourite birds that I saw oop, at Minsmere, um, Palace's warbler that was in the sluice bushes. If ever, for anyone that's not been to Minsmere and is going to go after they listen to this talk, um, the sluice bushes is just south of the sluice along the dunes at Minsmere. It's a patch of sort of a withy of willows and it's got it's had all sorts of birds. It's probably the best place to look for things like palaces and yellow browed warblers. And they had a dusky warbler there this autumn. It's had a few other things as well, like a couple of red flank blue tails. And I think I think there was a white throated robin there at one point as well. So it's definitely a good spot to look for migrants. Um, June's also a great place to see black red start. They breed at, on the old nuclear power station site at Sizewall just down the coast. So there's always some juveniles or something knocking about in the dunes, but they can still be pretty hard to see. I think they quite like sitting inside the gorse bushes. So they just disappear sometimes, which is good. And then the other two, I'm sure everyone knows what these are, but there's a wind chat and um, two pied fly catchers. And this was a, in a week where we had what felt like a lot of passerine migrants. So I think a lot of birders on the East Coast had a really good time this autumn for pied flycatchers. Um, this photo where there's two in the same sort of scope view, there was probably 15 up along the coast at Minsmere. And likewise with the wind chat, there was um, I think six of them in that general area. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, this is this is really sort of a birdie week. There's tons about. And um, it it just goes to show how much stuff's changed because Winchap is a historic breeder at Minsmere as well and hasn't bred in Suffolk for donkey's years. But um, I just want to read a little bit about from this book about the what Bert Axel calls the Great Fall, um, which was a huge migrant fall they experienced. And I thought it was really interesting to see what I thought was a good time for migrants versus what they had. So this um, great fall that he talks about was in on the 3rd of September, 1965. And they had sort of classic birdie migrant conditions, sort of like northeasterly winds and a bit of rain. And he talks about how they went out in the morning and they were a bit disappointed and there wasn't as many birds as they'd been looking forward to. And then they had an afternoon shower at about 1 p.m. And in his words, birds just started dropping out of the sky. And there's all these crazy accounts. He said um, it happened along the whole coast of Suffolk. 
that I think it was fishermen up at Lowestoft said that birds were falling onto their heads and crashing into them. There were so many birds. So they went around the reserve for the rest of the afternoon and tallied up everything. And this was their totals from the, um, the Great Fall. 7,000 red starts, 4,000 wheat ears, 2,000 garden warblers, 1,500 pied flycatchers, 750 windchat, 500 willow warblers, 400 robins, 300 spotted flycatchers, and 200 white throats, which is just, it's orders of magnitude above the, even this, which I thought was a good day. So, like 750 windchats compared to six, it's, it's not even comparable. But they also had, along with those more common migrants, 25 rhinek, 25 blue throat, two or three dotrel, tawny pipit, Icterine warbler and Ortolan bunting, all in the same afternoon. And it goes on to talk about how it wasn't just confined to the coast, like people were seeing huge amounts of migrants, even seven, eight miles inland. So just the sheer quantity of birds that must have come in then was just incredible. But for someone like me who's never experienced that, having a 15 pied flycatcher fly, pied fly day, that's still really good birding fun for me. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. So I talked a bit about um, some of the rarities that I saw and I put these together because this happened in the same day. So I was out on the reserve checking um, water levels and salinities and one of the gauge boards you have to check from inside the hide. So I went into the hide, I think it was West Hide on the scrape and a visitor said that they had a bearded tit feeding right in front of the hide and a little me thought oh that'd be quite nice get some good views of bearded tit for once rather than just a little blob flying above the reeds and he pointed to the bulrush and I was like that's not what bearded tits do and then out from the back of the bulrush popped this penduline tit so I was pretty happy with that that was a good day and then in the afternoon we went to check, we went to Dingle Marshes, which is a site to the north between Dunwich and Warbleswick. Um, it's also fantastic if you're ever in the area, you go to Minsmere, I'd recommend a walk on Dingle Marshes. Um, we went to the RSPB site there to check on a contractor who'd been profiling some scrapes. And a couple of weeks before, one of my colleagues at the time, Paul, had thought he had an Eastern Yellow Wagtail fly over his head. And he went on about it for these whole two weeks, saying about how it was monochrome and the call and all this. And I think there was what a bird on Anglesey at Kemlin not long before this. So a lot of people had learned a lot through that. And he said, oh, bring your camera along because wouldn't it be funny if it turned up? And we walked out onto this freshly created scrape and it was right there <laughs> calling in front of us. So that was good fun. And that was the f first record of the bird for, um, for Suffolk. And then I think in the same winter, there was two more Eastern Yellow Wagtails in Suffolk, both at Havergate. And this autumn as well, there's, there was two at Dingle and another one at the newly created Carlton Marshes Reserve. So these just seem to have become really common. I mean, Suffolk's gone from no records at all to six in 12 months, which is fantastic, really. And this bird stayed for a long time, put on a good show for lots of birders. There was a, a normal, normal Western yellow wagtail with it as well, so you could compare the both. And there was a flock of snow buntings on the beach that would run back and forth, forth back and forth in front of this ridge that the wagtail frequented, which was quite fun. Um, and then probably my best find of my time at Minsmere, which is a bit sad because a lot of people would think it's quite a little dull bird. It was this Iberian chiffchaff. And I think it was um, Ben Porter found one um, in Wales and had been posting about it on the WhatsApp group. And I'd listened to the recording on that. And then I'd been listening to other recordings. So I can sort of thank him for this because I think if it wasn't for him finding that bird, the song wouldn't be fresh in my head. And I just cycled past this one on a public road on the edge of the reserve and it was singing and I was like, oh, I've been in Jeff Jeff. 
and it, it stayed for three months singing in the same spot on territory which is fantastic really i think there was a bird on the reserve the year before which was singing for a week or 10 days so yeah and the, the bird the year before was the first record for the reserve so this one was cool stayed for three months which was nice but um it has to be the best bird i can't resist a, a rarity everyone likes it um the best bird I saw of the 12 months at Minsmere has to be the city turn. So there's a chap called John Grant, who is, um, his nickname's the King of Minsmere. <laughs> and he patches Minsmere almost every day. And he's got a really keen eye. He loves his gulls. Um, he'll tell you exactly how many Caspian gulls and yellow legs are and exactly what age they are. And he's found some cracking stuff over the years. He found an adult summer plumage Audwin's gull on the scrape one year, which is pretty good going. But we got a call through. I think I was mucking out a stable at the time, so in the rain. So I was quite, quite glad that this came through, that John had had a city turn or a bridal turn, fly straight over the scrape and head south. And everyone who was up at the work centre, where the office and the yard is, doing serious work, just dropped everything. And when I think I grabbed a bike, the nearest bike I could find, and I cycled to Sizewell on this bike with a broken seat and my scope like dangling off my shoulder. <laughs> and I got, got to Sizewell and the bird was there with the um with the kittiwake colony. And this kittiwake colony is on the um the old rigs of the outflow at Sizewell Nuclear Power Station. And yeah, the city town was just flying around. I'm not sure how far they off are offshore, within 100 meters, flying around with the kitty rakes. And you could hear the bird calling. And they have this um, amazing call. It's like kawaki whack, this sort of three syllable call. And yeah, it just sounds tropical, not what you expect to hear in sort of a dull, dreary day <laughs> off, off Suffolk. But yeah, that was fantastic. And that's actually the, um, the third, third record of City Turn at Minsmere. So, need a bride or next. <laughs> I thought I'd talk about some other stuff at Minsmere. It's great to see. It's the best place I've ever been to see adders as well. And you can almost find these in every single habitat. So, a couple of these photos are taken in the dunes at Minsmere, the same place. You walk through it to go around the scrape, and it's fantastic for Dartford Warbler. It's a brilliant place to see adder as well. This um, photo in the bottom bottom left corner, I just took through my binoculars in, I think it was mid-March. And this was a ball of male adders that had just come out and started to bask. The males typically come out and bask before the females and it aids with spermogenesis and things like that. They come out quite dull and brown like this. And then they slough and shed their first skin and have this really stark, almost like blue, duck egg blue, gray color. But yeah, this this ball was six male adders, including a melanistic one, all just basking in this one spot of sun together. And um, I think the other photo was taken up on the heath. Again, that was um, one of two adders that had emerged from my binacular together, males in in March. Um, it's a great place to see melanistic form as well. I know some populations have them and others don't, but. Um, that population on the Suffolk coast seems to have a few. And there's a, a big female melanistic adder in the dunes that sunbathes almost on the path, like you can walk right by it. So yeah, it's definitely a good place to see adders if everyone, anyone's looking. But they also do inhabit the wetlands as well. And there's not many places on the paths where you can get into that sort of scrubby wetland edge. But if we were there to do any sort of management or surveys, I found quite a few basking under bramble bushes and stuff right next to the wetland. And um, I'd probably just assume that that's from um, the amount of amphibians there as a good prey source, but I don't know if they move there after the hibernation because you'd assume that they'd get flooded out from any sort of subterranean hibernacular in the vicinity, but they seemed to quite enjoy it, which was really interesting. Here as well. Minsmere is a fantastic place to see red deer. Um, 
it was quite funny. I feel bad, but a lot of people would ask you and say, where, where are the deer? Like, I can't see any deer. And it's amazing how big an animal, sort of the largest terrestrial wild mammal in the UK, how easily they can hide. And out in the reed bed and the wetlands, there's probably close to 100 red deer at any time. And you can look out even from some of the high hides, like bitten hide, across the whole wetland and not see anything. You might see an ear flick up occasionally, but they're out there and it's just a <laughs> chance of seeing one. This um, it's one of my favorite photos I've ever taken on the right here of this stag at sunset. I was actually stood in the sluice bushes looking for migrants and I looked out on the south levels towards those chapel ruins and um, the stag just sort of walked up onto one of the old banks and stood in front of the sunset. It's it incredible. Um, if you ever want to go to Minsmere and see red deer, um, you can have a look for them on some of the arable reversion plots, which are really dry, grassy heath designed for the stone curlew. There's often groups of over 100, sometimes up to 200 hinds would, and young stags will sit out together. Um, it almost looks like the Serengeti at some some points, but you can also get um, 4x4 safari that Minsmere offers as a group. I think it's something like £100, and I'm not sure they'll offer it for a while because of COVID. But um, I think you can hire out the um, 4x4 with a guide for £100. He'll take you out across the reserve, and you can get some really stunning like close-up views of stags and all sorts of wildlife at Minsmere that you wouldn't generally have access to. So that's a really um, good thing to do if anyone gets the chance. Um, bugs, invertebrates, also Minsmere is a fantastic place to see these. Um, if you like your butterflies, you can have a cracking day butterflying at Minsmere and surrounding area. Um, purple hair streaks and green hair streaks in their season are just abundant. Small coppers and common blues, the common stuff is everywhere. But um, we've also got silver studded blue out on the heath. There can be huge profusions of silver studded blue, clouds of them. And um, it's a fantastic place to see those. Um, and you can also find things like white letter hair streak, which um, doesn't breed at Minsmere anymore, but it used to. There's still a population clinging on in Dunwich Forest where Minsmere manages some areas of heathland within the forest as a satellite site. You can still go and see white letter hair streak there. Um, there's a population in Purple Emperor quite close by. Some of the woodland butterflies that never used to be at Minsmere, things like silver washed fritillary and white admiral, have really bounced back and colonised a lot of new woodland sites in Suffolk recently. And, the main ride through the woods at Minsmere in sort of summer is fantastic. You can see so many species of butterfly and have silver wash fritillaries just flying around your head. And um, a lot of the dragonflies head into the woods as well. So in the top right corner here, it's a pretty bad photo of a Norfolk corker, but these are hugely abundant at Minsmere, even sometimes the most abundant dragonfly on site. So typically the four spotted chasers will emerge first and then the Norfolk hawkers start to emerge. And as the four spots die off, Norfolk's can become the most abundant dragonfly that you see out in the wetlands. And they'll likewise head into the woodland and um, hawk insects in the woodland ride. So that's really fantastic to see. And they've only colonized them in there in the past, I think 25 years or so. So definitely a lot of changes in dragonfly populations and distributions in the UK. There's some other things as well. Um, Willow Emerald, um, which has recently colonized, I think within the past couple of decades on the Southeast coast. Willow Emerald are really abundant at Minsmere along the, um, oh, I've forgotten what it's called. <laughs> the, main, the main track that goes down to the Sluice, the Sluice Trail at Minsmere. There's some overhanging willows and alders over ditches at the side of the track. And that's a really good place to see these little willow emerald damselflies. They're really attractive sort of greenish bronze coloration. And they actually lay their eggs in the stems of willows and alders by injecting with the ovipositor, laying the egg inside the wood, 
which is really interesting. And you, you've got a good chance of seeing other rare dragonflies as well. Uh, this is a red vein data that turned up in May. They've bred on the reserve before. Um, things like I saw a lesser emperor when I was there as well. And some years it's really good for things like vagrant emperor. It's just a fantastic site for dragonflies and damselflies. Um, another bug that Minsmer is pretty well known for, I think it was Steve, Steve Cully that told me to have a look at these and <laughs> feed them some wood lice, but these are ant lions and um, they colonized the UK, uh, I think within the last three decades, so sometime in the 90s, but Minsmere, I think, was one of the first places they were actually found. So the best way to find them is to look out for these larval pits, which you can see on the left here. They're like little tunnels. And the larvae sits at the bottom of the tunnel, like this. And they wait for unsuspecting ants or anything to walk into their little funnel trap. And the larvae will actually chuck sand up the edges of the funnels to flush its prey down into the bottom and then grabs it with these pincers. It's fantastic. If you ever um, go to Minsmere, the area around the solar panels at the car park and um, around the footings of the visitor centre itself is a fantastic place to see these. And um, on the right here, there's a winged adult. They occasionally come to the moth traps at Minsmere, and I think this one came to the moth trap, but I've never found one in the day that they just sort of sit on a branch and don't really do anything. But yeah, fantastic beasts. Um, yeah, moths as well is a pretty interesting thing at Minsmere. They've been doing moth trapping pretty consistently now for 26 years. So there's a data set with the same type of traps going back 26 years, which is fantastic source of data and the wealth of species is just mind-blowing because I think I think there's about 1,126 species recorded so far definitely over 1,100 but just staggering and it's because you have such a high diversity of habitats in one spot as well as being coastal for that migrants so the same sort of thing that makes it a cracking place to go for a day's birding with that sort of variation of habitat and the coastal combination makes it just incredible for moths. There's, you get some highly specialised reed bed wainscots and other heath specialists as well. So there's a female emperor moth here in the bottom left corner. Who, um, I caught two of these in the trap one night, which was really good fun. And then Minsman is also very good for large catacola moth species. So in the top left here, it's a pretty terrible photo, I apologize for that, but um, it's a dark crimson underwing, which they think are now breeding at Minsmere. Um, because Minsmere has ancient oak woodland as well, so a lot of the species that are associated with that you can find at Minsmere as well. And down here is another catacola species, um, Clifton nonpareil, non Blue underwing, um, really, really cool moth. They are absolutely massive. I remember my first day at Minsmere, I walked into the office and um, Robin, who is the site manager, just sort of peered around a door at me and said, do you like moths? And he thrusted this cup into my face that just had a huge Clifton non in it. It was brilliant. Um, they're suspected of breeding at Minsmere as well. I think they had 12 individuals last year and four so far this year so it's highly likely they're breeding in the local area um so yeah that brings me to the end of my little slideshow i'm not sure how long it's taken me but sometimes i'd speak quite fast so i hope it's not gone too quickly but i thought i'd end with a little note about um sizewell c so most people who've been to minsmere any time in the past few decades will have seen this huge globe on the horizon which is the sort of dome covering the reactor of Sizewell B, the nuclear power station. And um, there's a proposed plan for uh, Sizewell C which will be the third power station in that area and um, the site will come right up to the Minsmere border. It will destroy an area of land that's managed by the Siz um, Suffolk Wildlife Trust and currently links up Minsmere as a habitat 
is connected via hundreds of other little nature reserves across the whole Suffolk coast. And this would just bifurcate that and cause five years, six years, or 10 years, I think it is for the um, construction phase of just noise pollution, light pollution, and um, untold damage. Essentially, they haven't, they don't, the RSPB doesn't believe that they've truly looked into the possible effects of this construction on Minsmere. So um, I'd urge you all to check out the Love Minsmere page on the RSPB website, and there's options there to contribute your name to petitions and other things to try and help stop or at least increase the um, ecological sort of um, study and um, offsetting of the development. But I think that's it. So if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask me, I'd be open or if I hand back to Nigel now.